Police in the world ain't easy. Somebody's got to do it. Oh, you have a giggle, mate. That's what you get, blood. Boom. <laughs> Splendid. At least our schools are the shooting gallery. I bet you Brits thought we were done with you after the Revolutionary War. Not even close. We have a very special occasion that we have been granted permission to do a lot of shooting on this rifle. We won't call it a review per se because it's only about a days of experience and a lot of shooting, but we can give a lot of good opinions being uh, seasoned shooters ourselves. So today on Grantham, I hope you'll join us as we talk about the British military's service rifle and probably the worst service rifle ever made. You what, mate? But before we get started, we of course have to thank the biggest sponsor of the channel. The biggest sponsor of the channel is the Sonoran Desert Institute. If you're looking to get your start in gunsmithing, they are the people to go to. Can't thank them enough. Go and check them out. And of course, who can we not forget? Micah. Primary arms. Yeah, great optics, great price. We love them. Everything else you could possibly want. Go and check them out. If you're looking to get better at shooting, Dry fire is the way to go. Mantis will turn your gun into a dry fire machine. We are dry firing a lot, right, Micah? Oh, it's so much fun. It makes it fun. It does. And of course, today I have to give a big thank you to AAC. Um, we are sponsored with them. They provide awesome ammo. We are shooting 77 grain today, and it is a performer, no matter what. So we love it. But with all that being said, talk's cheap. So right here, we have the L85A1. It should be noted that there is a upgraded version that is in use within the British military. But unfortunately for them, we're gonna be using the original version because why, Micah? It sucks. Just because we we owe you guys some favors from the War of 1812. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start with our favorite thing. Me and Micah are gonna be running drills with this piece of shit. And we're gonna see who is better with this terrible, terrible rifle. Are you excited? No. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Uh, we're gonna be starting with the bill drill on semi. And uh, it should be noted how off the optic is. Um, that's because the optic requires special tools. Oh, <laughs> neat. <laughs> it's a feature. Does that, does that count? No. <laughs> two, two, six. I'll take it. Oh, God. So, I don't think the optic is on at all, but I was up there. It's two out. What is that? Point one per Charlie. So that's two, four, six. I am Micah now. I have never shot this gun, and I hate it. Stand by. Uh, 194, good job. And you were all in, so I guess I just suck with the SA-80. So you win. I don't know if it feels good to be good with these kind of guns. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna run it really, really fast. Um, we'll, uh, we'll try to give it about six rounds but it will be about keeping it in the A zone. Cool. Stand by. I was way off. I don't know if you were or the optic was. The gripping wasn't bad, but I was certainly off on two, three, four, five, hey, six. Are you using the irons or the scope? Irons. We're you using the uh, optic? Yeah. Damn. Should, Should I, I just use the irons or yeah. the optic? I use the, I use the irons. 
Okay. Stand by. Ah, dude. It's getting hot. Don't touch that right where your thumb could go. Don't touch that. Yeah, it's the, that's the same problem the M4, though, with the front sight post. Fuck! <laughs> Don't touch the heat shield under there, either. Yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ! The problem with the M16A1. Nice. Good job. I think that, uh, I think the optic is way more on than the irons. I think you're correct. Obviously. <laughs> oh, way better. Oh, yeah. You know what? I guess when you're close enough, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> Those are going to be two to the chest, one to the head. Oh. One, seven, three. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually very good. Yeah, not bad. Switch. Okay, shooter, are you ready? Yeah. Stand by. One, two, eight. I don't understand why you're so good with these shitty guns. It, it's always it's always the gun that doesn't matter, man. It's always these stupid, obscure piles. Missed that first one. Give me one do over. Three, one, six. Oh my god. I got lost in the optic. Three, five. <laughs> Shoot ready. Stand yeah. by. Dude, I got lost in the optic twice, Four, six, so five. I... Okay, one more time, one more time. I hate this. Yeah. So once you insert a mag, you can reload several ways. You can either run the charging handle, or you can hit that little guy right there. It's the most awkward kind of reload I've ever done. So what we're gonna do right here is a one round one because that is the basis by which all guns are judged, right, Micah? Yeah. <laughs> but it's just to show you kind of how awkward the um, controls are on the L85. Oh Gosh, that was, give me one more. I think that's about as fast as I can do it on the L85, dude. What was it? 407. You're doing great. Ah. Have you ever All seen- right. I've never reloaded this Have gun. Have you seen the uh, videos of uh, Firepower United when he does the fucked up, like, reloads on the M16? Was that me right there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Christ. Hey, you ever been kicked out of the military? You just got kicked out of the British military. Was your apparel designed by some designer who's never run a mile in their life? Or was it designed from input from athletes in tier one military operators? Because Barbell Apparel did just that. Now, the reason we here on the channel like Barbell Apparel so much is one, it's a lot of stretch. Take a look at these pants right here. Especially when you conceal carrying, it's nice to have a little bit of give. And then also if you do any type of rucking or squatting, it just sucks when you don't have give. These are athletic cut, they feel great and they look great. And for those of my dudes out there getting big and swole, there is a lifetime replacement guarantee. Whether that's size, ripped or torn clothing, they'll replace it. Barbell Apparel. If you don't have it, then you probably don't lift and eat meat. That's wrong. Get yourself some Barbell Apparel. So we have done a lot of shooting with the L85A1. About 700 rounds at this point, which is a real treat. This isn't a rifle that you get to see every day in the United States, especially one that is in the configuration that we have right here. Um, we do have to give credit where credit is due. So the um, both the N94 and the SA80 that we have out here, the L85A1, are from Maxims from their collection. So a big thank you to them for um, allowing us to borrow them and put rounds on these very priceless weapons because there aren't, as far as I know, a lot of these rifles that are currently in the US. So very base of them. Thank you very much, Maxim. And uh, let's get into it. And now it's time to do our favorite portion, which is talking about it from a shooter's perspective, from a military perspective, um, more so than the engineering perspective. Um, so my name is Mike. I retired out of Air Force Special Warfare and uh, spent a good amount of time in the military. And now I just do a lot of shooting. And then, of course, we had Micah. Micah, what's the best way you describe yourself? Nerd. Nerd. Gun enthusiast. Gun enthusiast. Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike. Yeah. Counter-Strike shoots better than me a lot of the times. So that's the cool thing about our channel. 
But getting into the L85A1, you have to realize that it was plagued with quite a few issues. I don't know if this was so much the problem of the design to some extent as it was the problems with the QC um, where it was made. And this is pretty unfortunate because I think that there were, it, it could have come out of the gate doing a lot better. But you have to realize that when it came out, at the time it came out, the M16A2 had already been out for a year or two and had already been adopted by the United States military. So when we talk about like reliabilities of, of, of a service weapon and being, you know, well tuned with 556, that had already been accomplished not just the M16, but multiple others. So when the British came onto the scene with the L85A1 and it finally made it into soldiers' hands, it was certainly a disappointment in many ways. It's not all bad. Um, I do have to note that when the um, L85A2 came out, which was basically an upgrade from HK, which was British owned, um, the weapon performed much better. And that's more than likely due to the fact that the tolerances were much better, the QC was much better, and essentially the entire rifle was gutted except for the receiver, and uh, you had a much better rifle at that point. Um, as far as my experience with this rifle, in practical terms, I spent a lot of time working with the British military. Um, th the guys know who they are out there. Um, so I, I got to talk to a lot of people about the L85 A2 mostly, not the A1, but you guys certainly have your opinions on it. In any case, let's go ahead, let's get into it. We're gonna start tip to butt, just like my, <laughs> my Royal Marines love, and we're gonna start with the flash hider right here. The flash hider is very, uh, very much so like the M16A1, which was a full spectrum birdcage flash hider, which means it's not, there's nothing, on the M16A2, if you take a look at this flash hider, you can see that it has, um, it's blocked off for the ports at the bottom, that way you don't kick up as much dirt when you're firing. Um, that's not so much the case with the L85A1. This isn't a bad design per se. It's just a design choice. It does a good job at flash suppression. It is longer than the typical A2 birdcage flash hider and performs very well in my opinion. When it comes to the L85 as a whole weapon, we do of course have a bullpup. What this means is that we're able to get more barrel length despite it being a shorter weapon. So, <sighs> Both the M16 and the L85 have the same barrel length, but as you can see, the L85 is quite a bit shorter than the M16 um, A2 right here. So it's quite impressive. Why this is important is the M4 is a very similar size to the L85, but the fragmentation range of 5.56 out of the M4 is much shorter than what you get out, out of the L85. Now there are, of course are problems with having a bullpup. The action being closer to your ear means that it's louder at the shooter's ear. Um, some ergonomic problems and weight distribution problems, especially during full auto fire. But there's always a trade-off, and the British decided that they really wanted to have a bullpup rifle. So, moving from the barrel, it is a very, um, from what I've seen, accurate rifle. We weren't able to test that as well, and that came down to a problem with we didn't have the correct tools in order to properly zero this older optic. That's not a dig against the rifle or the optic, it's just um, those tools are somewhere in, in the United Kingdom. God knows where but if you have them, send them to us. From talking to soldiers who served in the British military, they have noted the weapon is accurate, and from everything that I've heard, it's slightly less accurate than the AR-15, anywhere from 1.5 to 2 MOA um, from the factory, and then from there, um, of course, you have your uh, about 4 MOA before it's retired out of service or barrels change, et cetera, et cetera. So, good on the barrel. Moving back to the handguard, this is where a lot of problems with the L85A1 kind of came into play. Um, the plastic that they use um, had a problem with the insect repellent that was used in the British military. So it ended up melting from that <laughs> uh, insect repellent. So that's super unfortunate, of course, um, for the composition of the plastic that they use, the composite material. But another problem was that this kind of top plate right here, um, it, it's really easy for this to come loose. So a lot of guys ended up zip tying it down. You can see why that would definitely be frustrating to have that happen in the field. Um, so that's definitely something that um, frustrated me as I was shooting because if it caught on gear as I was moving, switching positions, that ended up catching. And that's kind of a, what's the best way to say it? It's kind of a theme that you're going to see throughout the L85A1 that there's these little things that just kind of irk you about the rifle as you're kind of working it, as you're shooting it, as you're going through it. So we do have a sling mount point right there. Um, no issues there, actually. It's a great mounting point, much like the M4. Moving back, I do have to say, Though my favorite thing about the L85A1 is how cool it looks. It, like I remember seeing this in like Call of Duty back in the day, and like the heat guard, the um, in the stamped sheet metal, these holes, it just looks cool as hell. I, I think it's one of the cooler looking bullpups out there. Do you agree with me, Micah? No. 
Micah just hates his rifle, so we can't, we're not gonna, we're gonna pretend he doesn't exist. <laughs> now, moving back from there, because we have a bullpup, um, we're gonna be slightly out of order, but we do have the fire control group. Now, when it comes to bullpups, um, something that a bullpup does suffer from is a worse trigger compared to a more conventional weapon. That comes down to the fact that on a conventional weapon, like an AR-15, there's not a whole lot of engagement that has to be released in order to release a hammer. On a bullpup, because the bolt is all the way back here, that hammer has to be all the way back there. That means this trigger has to have a bar that's traveling all the way back. Longer bar just means you're gonna have to exert more force. The bullpup triggers are typically more gritty, longer, they just feel worse. And people say a trigger doesn't matter. I highly disagree with that. I think a good trigger is a godsend for a shooter. Um, people will probably disagree with me, but as long as I've been shooting, and as many rounds as I've shot, I found that the more I shoot, the more I appreciate a good trigger. So, with all that being said, let's go ahead and let's try the trigger out right here. Okay, going into it, we have about three millimeters of play. Pushing into it, about five, six, about six pound pull. Let's feel that reset. Coming forward about three, four, five, six, seven, seven millimeters. Oh, uh, that's a long reset on that guy. From the reset, good let off about four pounds. Not a terrible bullpup trigger. There are, of course, better ones out there. Um, I think the Devore has an exceptional uh, trigger for a military rifle that is a bullpup, but this is certainly miles better than the Styrog, which is still, to date, the worst trigger on a bullpup I've ever felt. So, not bad for my British military guys. The safety is right here, right above the trigger. So, press in for safety. So, when you're holding this weapon, this is a right-handed weapon. If you need to disengage that safety, it's with the trigger finger, and then you're on your trigger. Um, being an AR-15 guy, um, of course, I love being able to kind of have my trigger ready and prepped um, and be able to flip, flick off the safety with my thumb on the opposite side. So I don't like um, using my trigger finger to disengage the safety. I do understand that for a military force, it is uh, a better safety protocol and procedure, but um, I'm not gonna specifically dock the rifle for that. That's certainly just a manual of arms thing. That's just me personally as a shooter, what I don't like about it. But the grip angle is fine. Uh, moving back into the action, the one thing I do have to say about the L85A1 is that um, I was really surprised at how smooth the bolt rides inside the rifle. It, I hope you can kind of see that or or feel that. It, it's an exceptionally smooth rifle, and you really have to give it to them um, for how good that feels. A lot of rifles, when you when you cycle them, when you rack them, you can feel a lot of grit, um, like the Styrog and stuff. It doesn't feel good to cycle. The L85 does. When it comes to its recoil, um, it's very much so Sire Aug like It's not incredible. And that's due to the fact that so much of your weight is kind of back that your muzzle has more of a tendency to rise. I understand this is, you know, there's always pluses and minuses to bullpups. I don't prefer it. I don't like the weight all the way back there. But so when you fire, it definitely does jump a little bit more than an Air 15. That being said, um, if that's a trade-off that you're okay with, then it's not that big of a deal. When it comes to select fire on this guy, um, I do find that it's um, it's not terrible, obviously, but it certainly has more recoil than many other 5.56 weapons out there. You can really feel that bolt kind of chattering as you're um, on auto on this guy. Not my favorite thing. Semi-auto is acceptable. So it... <laughs> The best way I could describe it is it's a bullpup. It, it, it's a little bit clunky when you're kind of firing it in semi and in, in auto. It's not the best experience, although you do have a very compact rifle. Now, moving back from there, we do have the magazine release. This is a big pet peeve of mine right here. So the magazine release is really not that protected at all. Um, and what can happen is it can push up against your gear, up against magazines and release. And this is a big complaint from the uh, British military folks. Of course, with the advent of the 82A1, um, this is no longer an issue. So the magazine release is just weird. The, kind of the whole manual of arms when it comes to reloading is a little bit weird. I understand kind of what they're doing. The idea being that you have your, let me get that locked in there. You have your bolt release right here. And I don't think I can get it with, uh, without a bullet in there. But the idea being that, you know, you mag, you're gonna rip that mag out. You put your mag in and then either you're going to reach up and hit that or reach back and hit that charging handle or reach over or press it up whatever have you it's just kind of odd on a lot of bull pups you usually end up having the bolt release somewhere back here because that way when you get that mag in you can just hit that bolt release and get moving 
I think that's a better position after having run many bull pups. I understand that the L85A1 is an older design, but that being said, we're still gonna dock it. It's just a very odd manual of arms when it comes to the L85A1. From the magazine going back, we do have the selector switch. This isn't uncommon to have a separate safety and selector. Um, a lot of my AR-15 guys are so used to safe fire auto, but on many rifles, it's safe fire up by the trigger group, and then you select the firing position um, at some other location. So right here, we have our select fire, and then up there we have our semi. Um, I think it's intuitive. I do like the location. It's certainly not something you're gonna be changing that quickly, but um, I really don't have a whole lot of issue here. I do have issue with the cheek pad right here. It's very well known that these crack very easily. And in fact, while we're shooting, it did crack. I do understand that this is an older rifle and you know, there's plastic has a finite life, but that being said, it was known to crack in many different environments. Same thing goes for the butt sock as well. Again, all these upgrades that were done by HK ended up fixing this, but I'm gonna take the moment to really kind of go hard on the rifle that when it kind of entered service, it could have avoided a lot of this with a little bit of QC and a little bit more on the soldier trial side to ensure that this didn't happen. If, and if we're not being honest about these things, then you know history is gonna repeat itself. But moving back from there, from the entire rifle, we do have the optic. Um, I understand that the optic is kind of a pain in the ass nowadays, but back then it was definitely very cool and very forward thinking. Uh, it is very Elkan like. In fact, I believe it was a predecessor to the Elkan. And the uh, reticle is very thick. That being said, uh, that was true of many reticles back then. I think it was a good thing overall, especially compared to many of the other service rifles that you had out there at the time. You have iron sights on the top. Um, it, the eye relief is not great on this optic, it's the SUSAT. S-U-S-A-T, let me see right here. Yeah, so it, it's not great, but for the time, good. Overall, the L85A1, um, definitely not my favorite shooting experience, definitely not my favorite rifle. <laughs> I am definitely not gonna say the worst service rifle. Um, I was just being dramatic there at the beginning. Um, but a service rifle that could have avoided a lot of the problems by simply putting this rifle through better trials. I think this is a weapon that you can certainly get good with. It can be very effective and deadly. The earlier earlier teething issues weren't due to the design so much as they were due to just poor QC. So overall, a good service rifle, a good military rifle, especially after the upgrades from HK. And I uh, really don't have a whole lot of problems with it other than I have to give the uh, British guys a hard time about it because you guys had kind of a rough go at the very beginning there. But here's the thing, guys. If you're training with this rifle, you're gonna be good with it, you're gonna get deadly with it. I've seen, you know, tons of different British military guys just absolutely crush these rifles. So get out there, train, get hands-on time with these types of rifles, and you're absolutely gonna do a great job and you're gonna rock. Guys, thank you so much for uh, hanging with us. We've got to review a lot of different cool, interesting rifles in the SA-80. The L85A1 is definitely one of those. Thank you for tuning in, and we got nothing else for you guys. Dad advice for today, don't discipline your kids out of anger. Discipline with a cool head, let them know what the problem was and correct with love. Thanks guys, talk soon.